definitely it was like to risk perfect your life. Okay. Yep. We're okay. live. Hello, hello, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to all of the earthly mothers and heavenly mothers. Mm -hmm. I do want to show respect for that on today. I know some of you may be struggling out there um, because you're missing your mama, and that's okay. Just own your feelings and your emotions. They're all beautiful. Um, my name is Ashley Jackson Thompson, and I am the owner of Timeless Dream Events, Caregiver Advocate, and New Author. Can't believe I can add that to my title now. <laughs> and I am here with my lovely sister friend in our caregiver advocacy, Miriam Baldwin, all the way from the Netherlands. Thank you for being here and standing with me in our power and helping other caregivers. Um, and I'm so excited to introduce our guest today. Um, I have been on one of her podcasts. Um, so you guys, if you tune into any podcast, you might have caught me on um, Gunjani's Battelle's Traumatic Transformations and Healing podcast. Um, so that's why we called this live <laughs> Traumatic Transformations and Healing Um we were just discussing earlier about uh, the time I had on her podcast, but I want to give the platform over to her so she can introduce herself. Thank you so much, Miriam and Ashley, for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Happy Mother's Day, like Ashley said. It's very well said, actually. I've never heard that before, but uh, I'm going to steal that one, earthly and heavenly, because, you know, Mother's Day, given what I do, Mother's Day can be quite triggering for a lot of people. And um, I knew it was for me at some point in my life when I was endeavoring that journey. So, uh, you know, for all the mothers who are on that journey, um, wishing you all the love and light and the ones that are planning to embark on that journey or triggering um being triggered by that we keep you in our thoughts and our you know sending you love too so thank you for having me on here i really appreciate it um so i am uh, my name is gunjani patel uh, oza and i'm a licensed mental health therapist in the state of california and florida and i've been doing this for almost 10 years and i specialize in depression anxiety post uh, like uh, PTSD, trauma, grief, loss, and addiction, mostly. I work with children, families. Um, but then uh, just in the past few years, as I was telling you earlier, I went through my own journey of postpartum depression. I'm an advanced maternal age mother. I waited for that long for um, reasons. Um, but, you know, I am finally a mother. It's been my toddler is almost going to be three years old in next month. And uh, I went through my own PPD stuff. I went through my own, you know, um, identity, figuring out who I am in this world at this point and what I what I want my purpose to be. So I went through a lot of soul searching in the past two years. So now, because of that, I ended up and launching a podcast called um, Traumatic Transformations. And I wanted to launch this podcast because I deal with a lot of trauma. I mean, tr I eat, breathe, sleep sweat trauma uh, because I've been through a lot of it myself. And I, I have come out on the other side with a lot of help. So, and my journey was quite interesting. So I, at this point for the past 10 years, I am I made it my goal to pay it forward and help other people who were going through the same as me, like I was lended that hand. And um, the reason why I called my podcast Traumatic Transformations, because through everything that happened in this past year with COVID, I wanted to do my best in order to normalize trauma. Now, I know that there are a lot of people that don't like the word normalizing trauma. Uh, but when I say normalizing trauma, the way I look at it is that a lot of people go through traumatic events in their life. I mean, I'm recently just reading this book called What Happened to You by Oprah. Love her. Um, so, you know, I just literally think that a lot of us have been through, you know, neglectful, abusive, very difficult childhood. And when I say childhood, it doesn't mean just the first few years of life. I also mean adolescent and in their 20s, because the prefrontal 
part of your brain doesn't really develop till you're actually 27, which is the reasoning, the judgment, the decision making, the meaning making I am and this who I am in this world doesn't really develop till you're that late. So in those years, there are so many people who've been through so many difficult things. And normally we associate trauma with, you know, combat, sexual abuse, or death of a loved one. But then there's also small T Tom traumas that can be bullying, losing a child, you know, having difficult divorce, having breaking up, you know, um, from difficult relationships, being in abusive relationships. So all of that to me also can be traumatic and it really changes the part of your brain that it changes your brain and the chemistry of your brain. So I really wanted to put, I, I wanted to be a medium where people find hope, where people find inspiration from other people's stories who've been through this because in this time more than anything, I really truly find that when you find hope it is one of the best medicine to recovering. Or, you know, when you're going through the worst times of your life, you just want hope. You just want to know that at some point you will be on the other side of the tunnel, even though it might not seem so. So I wanted to do that and I launched it. We are almost six months this this month. So I'm really excited and I want to continue to get this, keep this journey going. Um, and in season two, we're going to focus on feelings, emotions, and healing, because that's also something that I find that most people, us, especially people of color, we don't grow up with what is emotional wellness. It's like, you feel emotions, get over it. And that's bad because that's almost toxic positivity. So well, I go to really, church and pray about it. Exactly. You know, Why so I we be both? <laughs> exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm feeling very, as I'm raising my toddler, I really feel the importance of raising emotional intelligence, raising emotional awareness, teaching people how to feel their feels and get through it and process it using adaptive coping skills instead of all the things that we end up doing because we don't have any direction. So that's sort of um, a small version of who I am. Marion, did you want to add? Please. Unmute yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were just sorry. fired up. Sorry, I already sorry. know. You were fired up. <laughs> um, I, I'm Miriam Boldevain. Most of you know me already. Um, owner of MiriamBoldevain.com, caregiver 2.0. Um, six week online program, caregiver advocate, devoted wife, and author to be soon. I'm so excited, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Gunyani, for, for being with us here. And I'm so excited, I'm so excited. And what you just mentioned you know, caregivers, um, we go through a lot, mm. and my first question for you is how do we how do we know that we are traumatized what are the symptoms so i i'm going to give you a little insight into my caregiving journey because um so i got married four years ago um uh, to my current husband here uh and i moved to california in 2017 i we brought his mother from tanzania africa because that's where she was and she has ms so she was wheelchair bound so i stepped into the role of caregiving you know right as i was uh, marrying and trying to figure out my way around the whole wife thing and then we were pregnant so our child happened in 2018 and then 2019, um, you know, as, as uh, she fell and she got hurt. So now she's with my sister-in-laws, but as I was taking care of her, one of the things, and I've realized this working with people, you know, who have, um, who have been caregivers most of their life. And there is huge burnout and exhaustion that caregivers go through, but then there's also guilt associated with self-care is selfish. So I'm going to just give it my all and do everything. And I was actually one of those people as I was doing it. And that's why, you know, when I said I was going through my postpartum uh, journey and I was also going to be in our, in our, in our trauma world, we call, we call it vicarious trauma as in, or secondary trauma. And what that means is that you being a caregiver for someone else and not having, you know, 
filling up your bucket and your cup and just giving so blindlessly and unconditionally because when you're in that role you don't realize that you're going through it till you come out of it and i am able to say this now because i i really realize now that in that three years as i was trying to figure out my you know identity around being a wife then a daughter-in-law also a caregiver to her while i was trying to figure out you know my work situation in california and then raising a child there was a lot going on so i think and now that I'm outside of it and she's not with me currently and she's with, you know, um, uh, uh, my sister-in-laws, I realized that, wow, that was a lot. I became one of those people who didn't take care of myself and just gave and gave and gave till I couldn't give anymore. And then I felt so resentful about it and not resentful as in I was mad at her, but I was mad at myself for not taking care of myself or, you know, not having set healthy boundaries. Um, when you experience exhaustion as if you just don't find almost, you get to a point where you don't find meaning to help, uh, meaning to your life, or it starts affecting your day-to-day -day psychological, like you wake up, you don't, you wake up just not looking forward to anything in life. You're waking up because that's something you do when you're on autopilot. When you are, you know, when your work or your school life is affected or impaired because of something that you're in, uh, or because of the caregiving that you are doing. And then there is a, and if you, if it starts affecting your employment in school, so there are three criteria that you have to meet in order for it to be considered trauma in the DSM. DSM is like the psych diagnostic, you know, statistical manual that we use to diagnose people so that we can provide appropriate care and treatment to the people that are coming to us. So it's not to per se label people, but it's just to figure out if you're meeting these criteria, then there are all these people going through the same thing, and this is how we treat people who are going through it. So if you are you know, not finding meaning or purpose, if you're finding, if you don't feel that you have enough support to help you through that, through that time of your life, or you feel alone and exhausted because you're just white knuckling your way through just trying to take care of somebody, then in our world, we call that exhaustion, burnout, and vicarious trauma. I hope that answers your question. So glad you bring that up because Mary and I talked with uh, Dr. Kate Steiner yesterday mm -hmm. uh, about burnout mm -hmm. and she tailored it around caregivers and you just bring all that back up you know yeah. it's uh, and when you mentioned resentment I don't know if I spoke on that mm -hmm. during our podcast but you know we almost have a similar situation mm -hmm. I uh, started taking care of my husband before he mm -hmm. became my husband. Mm -hmm. So we've had to, you know, I've had to rethink what resentment means, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily, I resent him, right. it was his body. It was mm -hmm. that stupid cancer mm -hmm. that entered his body that I would, I was mad and resented. Um, mm -hmm. And then just grieving what our life could have been supposed to have been, mm -hmm. you know, in my head, mm -hmm. what it was supposed mm -hmm. to have been, but yeah. it totally changed once we got that diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot, and you're right. It's like, you know, we, we often think of the word resentment and we think it's like some hostile intervention that we feel against someone and it's not resentment if it's not that. But, you know, I, 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 I'm very big on setting boundaries and teaching boundaries. And one of the things that I've learned is that if we, and boundaries, I think oftentimes is very misconstrued as in, you know, boundaries as in I'm telling you no, or I'm being mean, or I'm being disrespectful. But instead, boundaries are, if you, if you do a little mindset shift and say, boundaries are just you communicating your needs, your likes, what you're okay with, and look at it as an expansive thing, as in, I am allowed to be in control of the amount of content, people, or things that I will put up with. And a lot of times, we don't think it like that. We think of a boundaries as, we're being mean if I say no. Well, but if you keep giving from an empty bucket, you will eventually get to a place where you won't like yourself and like that person for not having set your boundaries. Um, so, boom. <laughs> Yeah. We can end the discussion now. <laughs> so, so boundaries, I mean, so resentment can look like, you know, it's just not towards the person, but like you said, grieving all the losses of things that could have been, all the 
things that you could missed out on, all the things that you wanted to do but couldn't because of stepping into that role, all the things that you wish that were happening or could have happened if you didn't sign up for this, you know? So there's a lot, it's 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 all, I, I, I feel like it's very layered and it's very complex. And that's one of the things I think therapy helps with. It helps with, you know, coming up with options. It's, it helps with a lot of compassion for yourself. It helps with curiosity of what those emotions that are, you know, data or information that you feel in your body from your brain and what are they trying to tell you? You know, a lot of times we misconstrue emotion as just, oh, you're weak or be strong or get over it or don't feel. And that's very, very toxic and negative um, because when you don't feel, I mean, when you don't allow yourself to feel or when you judge your feelings or when you just discard it, it goes back in your body. It literally resets and it comes back 10 times more because it's trying to tell you that you care about something and obviously your values are affected. So go into it with, how can I be curious about what is this trying to teach me? What is this feeling trying to teach me about my values? Instead of why am I feeling this? Why me? Why does this keep happening? Yep. And saying no to someone is saying yes to yourself. Absolutely. I, I really had to learn that. Yeah. It was hard. It is very hard Getting because boundary, when you're in it, you're hard. in it and you can't see things because you're so blindfolded. We can only see things when we step out of it or when we allow ourselves to step out of what we are in. And yeah. in the midst of taking care of someone, I think a lot of times people have all this, you know, anxiety that they feel, they lose themselves. So there's all this, you know, uh, low level um, depressive symptoms that people feel like mild, depending on where you are and, you know, what you're doing. Uh, or where you have been in life and, you know, your genetic predisposition and all those different things. So there's a lot of things that happen when you're in an event and you can't see anything and thus you can't see hope because you're in it. You're so deeply ingrained that you don't know what else to see. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when do you know if I can imagine that a lot of people don't know that they are traumatized, that yeah. someone else needs to tell them. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's good. Yep. Because sometimes, like I was saying, when you're in it, you don't realize that you're going through something that is so uh, difficult. And I think that's where the lack of awareness is and the education around it comes in mm -hmm. because I feel very strongly about that. Like when I was, like I was telling you, when I was going through it, given everything that I know and what I treat, I still didn't think that anything was wrong or was happening. I knew that there was something wrong, but I didn't know how else the situation could help. I even tried to ask for help, but we didn't have that help and support. So sometimes when you are in it, like you said, uh, you know, some other people need to, it's like the whole intervention thing that people do, you know, when they're suffering from substance use or other addictive uh, behaviors. Yeah. I think it's important to listen. It's important to ask for help. It's important to share with people what you're going through. And for the people who are on the receiving end of that, instead of trying to fix their problems, instead of trying to give them all this advice, instead of trying to take away all the things that they're feeling, I think just being there and asking, because I think in our world, and I, I don't know about you, but for me, right, I in, in the South Asian community, there's this whole thing about, you know, people just want to fix people's problems. People just want to jump in there and solve everything. And it's like a lot of times one of the things that we teach is, you know, just be there. Holding space for someone is in, I see you. I am listening to what you have to say. I am so sorry you are going through this. So there's this whole difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Sympathy is when you feel sorry and it's like distant. Like, I'm so sorry you're going through it, but okay, you know. Empathy is... I want to put myself in your shoes, can only imagine what you're going through. Wow, I can't even imagine. And compassion is shared. Compassion is actually very action and value oriented, as in you're going through this. Let me step in and help you the way you need to be helped. What do you need right now? How can I help you? Can I research stuff for you and help you find help? Can I, you know, um, come out there and do your laundry or do some, you know, cooking for you? What is it that you need right now that I can help you with? I'm here 
sending you all the love, sitting here with you in these moments, whatever you need, you're not alone. That makes a huge difference in people who are going through trauma, realizing that they have the support that they need. Because otherwise, you don't realize that you are even traumatized till much, 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 much later. Or never sometimes for some people. <laughs> so relatable, Ashley. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know where to start, Miriam, because all the things. See, this is, she got me, you were probably my second or, no, you were like my third mm. podcast that I had been on. Mm. And me going in, like what I was telling you earlier before we went live, I thought I was going to talk about my caregiving journey. Mm -hmm. Little did I know the conversation was going to start. 10 it's going to be 10 years ago for me, the, the sudden loss of my dad. Mm. And I was like, wait, no, I don't, I don't, I still <laughs> want to keep that here. Yes. I don't want to talk about it just yet, but it's so freeing. The more you talk about it, um, just like I told one of my, my sister friends this morning, she actually just lost her mother um, a couple days ago. So this is her, literally her first Mother's Day without her mom. Mm -hmm. And I had texted her this morning. I said, I'm thinking of you. I know this is hard. Grieve in the way that you can yeah. it yeah. need to, whatever that looks like for you. My grieving is different than yours will, than right. Miriam's, you yeah. know. So do what you got to do for you. But just know that I'm here to talk and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for you. Yes because this sucks Absolutely. it does <laughs> it sucks Absolutely. Yep. and you know i but i will be here to help you in any yeah. way that you need my help if you need a call and just cry or just talk mm -hmm. i'm here you know and i wish when people told me that when my dad passed i took them up on it yeah i wish when people said hey Ashley, like, what are, what do you need right now while Troy is going through all this chemo? Oh, nothing. I'm good. I nope. got it. Yep. Yep. Because like you mentioned earlier, you don't want to seem weak. Yes. And I thought if I asked yeah. or if I did take up the offers of help, that made me look weak. But in reality, I should have went ahead and took the offers yep. because that would have showed my strength. Mm of being able to think of me because my mental health is very important too. Absolutely. And it's taken me almost 10 years <laughs> to realize that, you know, through different uh, avenues, I've been able to work through grief. Yes. But it never goes away. And that's what I told my friend this morning too. I said, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for you, girl. <laughs> Cause I, you know, it's been 10, almost 10 years in September. It will be 10 years. And the scar tissue is still there. Yeah. It's never going to go. Yeah. It's See, and I also think grief is, not, grief is not about moving forward. I mean, moving on, you know, from the event that happened or the person that you love so dearly. It's How can you move on from someone you loved, you know? Moving on because your world stops. Yeah. Right. 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 Moving 10 years forward. Forward. Yeah. Your world yeah. stops. And it's. I think it's 26 years. This year it will be 27 years that my dad passed away and I still miss him. Yeah. And that's exactly, it's like grief is not about moving on. It's about moving forward. It's about moving forward and second, creating a new identity without your people, without your loved one, you yes. know? So it's not just, oh, I need to just move on from this. <laughs> you never move on, but you move forward when you're ready and as you're ready so that you don't stay stuck in the life that you are given to make all the moves that you are so deserving of, so beautiful and are capable of. So uh, it's absolutely not about, you know, just moving on from someone that you loved and you still love. I, I I, I believe in that, but um, I really think that, you know, it's about moving forward from your loss and continuing to find yourself and create your new identity as a result of that loss. Yeah, um, I love that. 
Yeah, and you know, as a caregiver, when your loved one is really suffering and you simply don't know if he's going to make it, like yeah. Ashley, like my husband Martin, like my brother Patrick, um, you live in fear, yeah. anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of what will happen to them. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's why you keep going on and forgetting about yourself you're losing yourself yes. absolutely absolutely you 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 sleep only a few hours a night you you you're exhausted so do you have any tips how to how to deal with those feelings because mm. those feelings they you're 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 living it every day as a carrier absolutely, absolutely. No, it's true. Um, so the way I, and my biggest tip because of what I do is seek help, seek therapy, because therapy is not just for people who are, you know, mentally ill. It's for anyone and ev everyone that has a mind and is stuck, you know? So I think it provides a place where you can get the, and again, there's a whole thing about finding a right therapeutic match for you, people, you know, who can, um, who are not trying to fix you, but who are there for you, holding space for your big feelings and just sharing that space with you so that you can heal because there is a lot of healing in knowing that you are seen, that you are being held, that you are being supported, you know, even in that one hour or, you know, and the work that you do outside of therapy, because there's a whole concept of neuroplasticity. So I just, like I mentioned earlier that, you know, as a result of undergoing trauma or extended periods of chronic stress, which we put ourselves when we are, you know, in that situation, if we don't learn to manage or if we don't learn healthy coping skills, then like you said, you literally change the, your brain. But the good part about your brain is that there is a concept called neuroplasticity. So you, you can change that brain just like, you know, when you were hurt, you change your brain, you, you change parts of your brain. You When you're healing, you also change it. So one of the things that I also people like, and that's one of the reasons why in my podcast, I was like, you know, it was not absolutely not meant to replace therapy, but it was as something, the work that you do outside of therapy, because the neuroplasticity requires consistency. You have to keep doing those new things that your therapist recommends or teaches you over and over in order for those new neurocircuitry connections to be built. Just like, you know, you got stuck in the rut of I'm trapped, I'm feeling powerless, I'm feeling helpless over and over. And those, emo those emotions and those neurocircuitry are very present and very, you know, there. I in order to change that, that also requires consistency. It requires specificity. So what that means is that if you're working, whatever you think on or whatever you pay attention to in your mind is the circuitry that you tighten, that you, you know, create. And that's one of the reasons why people who have undergone trauma, it's hard because those circuitries are so tightly knit over time, over and over, same thing, that you cannot, that's why a lot of, I, I believe that a lot of times the mindset work doesn't work. There's a time and place for it. It does work. But if you're really trying to do get that deep unstucking done, then you need deeper help. So there are all these different types of therapy, trauma, not just um, trauma informed, but you want to go to someone who specializes in trauma because you are making changes in your brain. Whatever you think, those those thoughts are, you know, those circuitries are trying to build and reconnect or, you know, form in the first place. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we see people day in and day out every week so that we help building those new connections. We help um, helping them deal with those emotions and, you know, um, make those new emotions and adaptive coping skills a norm that never used to be. Um, one of the things that I tell people to do in the meantime, you know, as just tips that they can do outside of therapy, if they don't have access to therapy, because I'm not blind, I know that not a lot, a lot of people have access to therapy, as much as I want everybody to be in therapy, I know that they don't have the financial means, they don't have the right person with the right training to help them with that. And that's one of the reasons why I did this podcast, because I was like, OK, all these people who did their you know, self-healing or who went through therapy or now on the other side of their trauma and experienced this post-traumatic growth where they were able to look at their beliefs, rewire their beliefs. Because sometimes what happens is we grow up with certain beliefs in our lives, right? They work through our childhood. They work through certain periods of our life. 
they were meant to keep us safe. They were meant to protect us. Sometimes they're not the right beliefs, but at the time it protected us, right? So it's like, you know, if you grew up with a, with with uh, with parents who were very abusive, or you know, in, in situ if you were in situations where you didn't feel safe, then you did all the things, even if it was not adaptive, to keep you safe in those moments, right? But then at certain point of your life, you get to a place where you're just like, yeah, this is not working anymore, and you feel stuck. You don't know what to get go, do otherwise because you're in it. So that's one of the reasons why people do therapy, so that it's like, okay, how can I explore other ways of being so that it still aligns with who I am today and my values and where I'm trying to go, but this stuff is not working anymore. And how can I forgive myself and others for going through that process? Now, forgiveness doesn't come that easily, but uh, eventually when you work through the shame, guilt, the disappointment, the vulnerability, the hurt, the anger, all those different emotions that are so stuck in your body, because what happens is that you um, and I do know that you asked for a tip, so I'm not trying to go on a tangent, but I'm trying to tell you why sometimes when you do self-healing, it doesn't work because there are all these things that happen. But just to keep that in mind and continue being perseverant so that when you try apply these tips, it it works. But so what happens is that you, the emotions that you feel when you're going through some, some things, they are, we gather them through the sensory data around us. So like what we smelled, what we felt, what we, you know, what we experienced in that moment while we're going through it, our body keeps the score. It keeps, you know, all the scores, all the emotions, they send messages to our body and then it's like, oh, anger. So it's like, if we are not used to being aware of what's going on in our day-to-day -day life, we don't know what to do with it because we are not even paying attention. Every day you accumulate some emotion in your body, whether it's good or it's bad good ones reward are rewarding parts of our brain and then we get excited and do it over and over the not so good ones we keep stuck in our body and then eventually it starts with an intuition like don't do this but then we don't listen so it, then it gets harder and stronger and it says don't do this and then you know you you feel those emotions in your body and you embody them and they get stronger and then eventually a lot of people who are caregivers they experience end up experiencing their own physical pain and chronic illness physical chronic illness because your body is keeping score of all the emotions that you didn't work through so wow. some of the tips that can help is journaling one of the biggest things that i tell people yes. write things down even if you have to audio journal just for all these things i'm so angry f it you don't even have to go out there and listen to it just get it out there because your body needs release exercise exercise and journaling is like you know it's just something that you're not storing in your body but it allows there i have this thing on my um on my igtv ig handle it's called g patel counseling and i have this free journaling work tool I, uh, and you have all these prompts and stuff that you can use sometimes people feel lost because they're like i don't know where to start well start yeah. with just writing you don't have to publish you don't have to become an author you don't have to do anything just write whatever comes to mind you just write because there are actual studies that show that people yeah. who journal there were like all these people who are going through depression symptoms and even for myself i journaling got me through days that i didn't think i was going to make it i just didn't think i was going to make it but wow. you know so there were there was a study done uh, where they studied a group of people who were experiencing depressive symptoms. Control group, um, they didn't journal, and then the journaling people journal for at least 10 minutes a day. And you can start with, well, three things that I'm grateful for. Well, my situation is crap, but okay, are you homeless? No, you have a home. I'm grateful for having ho a home. I'm grateful for clean water. I'm grateful for, you know, being able to have food and not have to worry about where my next meal is going to come from. Whatever it is, just what three things that you are grateful for, because then you switch on the positive parts of your brain, like, oh, there's a possibility that I didn't think that existed. What, what are you grateful for? And then three things I want to let go of. What do I want to let go of today? I want to let go of feeling anger towards the person that, or I, I'm letting go of all this fear today, just a little bit at a time. I, because most of the time we get so caught up in comparing ourselves to other people that instead I am a big believer of take that in and say, how am I better today than I was yesterday? How am I even one person better than all the things that I did yesterday? And if you continue to accumulate that throughout the entire year, 
that that can be a new you by the end of the year. Otherwise, your situations are not going to change if you don't change. Right. So right. journaling is one of the biggest things that I absolutely recommend to people. Then second is meditation and visualization. I'm very, very big on meditation and not everybody does it, but there are a lot of people that do do it. And there's all this scientific evidence about what meditation do. And people say, I have a hard time with being still. And I know the idea is not being still. There are different kinds of meditation out there. There are active meditations. I mean, there's an app, free app. It's called Insight Timer, I-N-S-I-G-H-T, Timer. It's a free app. There are 80,000 different guided me meditations that you can go through. And for people that say, I don't have time, I say, you, that's why you need to do meditation because it yeah. really clears up your brain, it clears up your heart. It's almost like praying, but just connecting with yourself instead of expecting all these things from the outside. When you are in unison with yourself, and it takes a long time to get there, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of self-searching, but you get there. But the idea is that you're just meditating for 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day so that you can let go of all the things that you're holding on to. Notice, get, take, get inward. One of the other things that I teach people is I'm, I teach them to do this. This is like almost like a hug that you give yourself when you are like five minutes every three hours a day, just taking five minutes to yourself, closing your eyes and just doing this and saying, when you do this, you, you release, there's a, a hormone called our neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is responsible for okay. making us feel good. So it releases additional serotonin. Like even me doing this while you're watching it, your body it there through there's a process called mirror neuron you, it produces those um neurotransmitters even if you're watching me do this so it's almost like someone is giving you a hug and then uh -huh. it produces another neuromodulator called gaba which which stops like the whole anxiety thing from when it's happening you know it's like um it stops the firing of your neurons which are very uh, activated so when you do that you're just taking time, five seconds to just be with yourself like everything is going to work out for me at some point or say an intention i am learning to feel safe i am and follow it up with i am i am powerful i am you know learning and sometimes people don't believe those beliefs because they're not there yet so you want to do a neutral affirmation or say something along the lines of i am learning to feel safe i am learning to accept where i am and this situation, I am learning to find hope. I am learning whatever it is that you're learning. And go inwards and notice where in your body, do an entire body scan, like head to toe, and just notice where am I feeling all the feels? So mm -hmm. I'm feeling tightness in my heart. I'm feeling all this tightness in my throat. I'm carrying some tension here. It's really dark and, you know, give it a shape, color, size, form. Where are you feeling? My feet are tingling and all these different things, right? And then you just spend that time and then you breathe. There is, I'm really big on breath work. I'm learning to become a breath work facilitator right now. And I really think that breath breathing is so powerful because it's the tool that's free. You have it in your body and everybody's like, I breathe. Well, that's not the same. Conscious <laughs> your emotions out. I am feeling anger. So you just six second inhale, six second exhale. So. And just notice where you're feeling and send this, your breath to those parts of your body that is in need of compassion, that is in need of love, that is in need of healing, that is in need of just support. And exhale everything out that you're carrying every day. I tell people to do this twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. Just mm -hmm. five minutes to your, with yourself and notice Release everything that doesn't belong. Release, release everything that doesn't serve you anymore. Instead, breathe in love and kindness and healing. Makes a huge difference. Awesome. I give you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did want to point out um, this is actually my friend that I was speaking about, and she just said, Thank you. I really needed to hear this message today. Hmm. So, God bless you, Ashley. I know it's hard. But thank you for being here with us. Um, Miriam, did you have another follow-up question? 
Oh and yes, of course. I I'm I still with the, I'm still I with the journaling, asked. the journaling, the meditation, the breathing because I do all yeah. of these exercises yeah. in the morning, and, and it really really helps. It yeah. took me a long time to start uh, with journaling, meditation, mm -hmm. because you know caregivers we we don't have time. That's the first yeah. thing we say. I don't yeah. have time. I didn't want to schedule because I didn't have time to schedule. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I thought wrong. And when I started journaling, I started with three minutes. I wanted four. I wanted five. I wanted six. And that's the same with meditation. It really calms me. And I love that you mentioned that people can say, I, I can't sit still. Yeah. Most people that come to me and say, I can't sit still. Well, <laughs> you know what I discovered? When I'm silent, mm. I can listen. Silent and listen have the same letters. Oh, wow. I, I don't know if that. I have ever noticed. Yes. Silent and listen have the same letters. Two ah. powerful words. Yes. I'm getting good with goosebumps as you say that. So true. It, me too. Me too. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> and you know, it um I had to make time for myself. And um I'm happy I did. You know, um it really helped me. Yeah. And it helped my loved ones as, as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Because I, I really transformed to a better caregiver. Yeah. Right. I, I Ashley and I always talk about it, that nasty place, you know, burnout. It's a nasty place. It's a place you don't want to be. It's dark. So these tips you just mentioned, I, I totally agree. And I I wish I had started earlier. Yeah. You know, finding time for myself, doing self-care and just taking care of myself instead of overthinking um yeah it's it's what what i what i want to know is can you you can heal from trauma right well absolutely uh, like i was telling you just like yeah. we change our brains from you know the traumatic things that we've been through we also change our brain through healing and it is absolutely like I have worked with people who've come through to come to me with the worst things that you never want to hear. But over time, with love, with compassion, with all these new coping, because it's like you, you can't jump straight to, you know, I'm better unless you work through all these emotions that you haven't worked through, but have felt in such a long time. You know, we feel whether if you're in a human experience at some point of your life, you're going to go through suffering some point. Yeah. And yeah. if you do, what, how are you changing as a result of that? How are you working through that difficulty? How are you accepting those emotions and embracing them so that they can teach you and pivot you into a place that you really, de you deserve to be and you're placed on this planet for? I, I personally think God doesn't give us anything that we didn't, we don't, with the he knows that we couldn't handle. And I really think that, we need to be able to, and like you were saying, Ashley, earlier, as in ask for help, because I was very like that too. I couldn't ask for help. And recently I just saw this uh, interview with Jack Canfield and he was talking about, you know, Oprah. And it's like everything that Oprah got in her life was through asking. You ask. If you don't have help, you ask. If you can't do it, you ask. You ask, ask, ask. Asking doesn't make you weak. It makes you stronger. And it takes a lot of courage to ask for help. It takes yeah. a lot. And so for people who think I'm asking for help, I'm weak, it's actually the opposite. It takes a lot of courage to ask for help. People who are weak don't ask for help because it, you, it's hard to muster up the courage to ask for that help because you, we are sort of supposed to do it all. We're together it, as a team. We can do so much more than if you just do it on your own. So through that experience of, you know, therapy or support, I think it's really to not lose sight of what was the question again? I forgot. It's really important to not lose sight of, you know, asking for help and getting the help that you need. But did I answer that question? What did you ask, Miriam? I asked if you if you can um, heal from a trauma. Oh, heal from oh, absolutely. So, yes. So I've worked with people who have been through really hard things 
And through our work, through our, you know, all the stuff that we worked on and dealt with, and, you know, I absolutely believe that things like depression, anxiety, and PTSD, you can be in remission. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person. It depends on who you're getting the help with. So there are a lot of factors to it. Right. Um, but you absolutely can. Like I, I'm going to give you my personal example. Um, not to say that my traumatic journey is going to be similar to your, yours. And again, it, you know, I, one of the very big things I, I, I am big on is trauma lies in the eye of the beholder. It's not for me to compare my things to other people, and it's not for them to compare their stuff to me. It's your experience. It's your journey. It, your healing is your journey. It's not a linear process like, oh, I am you know, seeking help, so now I'm all the way on the other side. No, it's an up and down, up and down. Just, like, just when you think sometimes that you made all this, you know, you did all this work and you were changing and all the stuff and things happened, I, I hear people condemn that and judge that. And I, you know, one of the biggest things as in, I just thought I was doing all this work and why me? Why is this happening all of a sudden? I thought I was healing and why again is this happening? And it's like, instead of asking that, ask yourself, what is this trying to teach you? Get in the role of observer, observe those emotions, observe those feelings instead of, and one of the biggest things that I tell people is that emotions are felt in the body, feelings are the meaning that we give it. So it's like the, if the experience is, you know, um, fear or threaten, if someone threatens you, the emotion felt is fear. There are six different emotions that we tend to normally feel. And then there are thousands of feelings that could be associated with it. So if the experience is threatening, the emotion is fear and the um, feeling could be anxiety, could be scared, could be horror, could be all these different things, right? So as you are healing, um, it's really important to keep in mind that what are you doing with your emotion and what, what is the kind of help that you are getting? So like for me, most of my 20s are in my younger teen days. Um, so when I was, I had a pretty good childhood for the most part till I was uh, preteen. And then I was sexually molested. And then, you know, I went through the whole process of, I in our culture, I didn't even talk to my parents back then about that it was happening. It happened for four years straight and that. Then I was supposed to get into med school because I always thought, oh, I was going to become a doctor. But that didn't happen because I experienced like the worst third degree burn and right before the most important exams of my life. And thus that went into drain and like, what? Whatever. Then I went through like, you know, some divorce in my early 20s. And that was like one of the worst things that happened. But at this point, now I can look back and be like, oh, that was blessing in disguise, because obviously it was not working for us. But I was so in it and I was not ready to let go. So that while all these things were happening, I was like, oh, everything was everything is OK. And in the meantime, I was putting, you know, I was crying myself to sleep every night. I was almost suicidal. Mm -hmm. right? I was just thinking, you know, I just want to die and cut my wrist and this and that. And I was just like, why, why am I even here? The idea is not that I didn't want to be here. It's just that I didn't want to feel the pain that I was feeling. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to feel like a burden. And then the only thing that kept me from not doing it was my mother, because I was like, I would devastate, it would kill her if I did that to myself. So then when I was in the program, while I was getting my psychology degree, they said, you have to get help to figure out, you know, what what it's like for people who come to you otherwise you know it's not okay so i was like nothing is wrong with me what do you mean get help and i got help and then all this stuff came out and i was just like wow what and it took it was a year and a half two year process but it was one of the most beautiful things that has ever happened to me and depression anxiety and ptsd are very genetically i'm big on intergeneration trauma so what we don't heal we mm -hmm. pass on to our kids. We leave for our on. children to heal. So 50% is, you know, uh, genetic predisposition. 40% is, you know, um, the the way we perceive the events and how we internalize it in our world, what we are taught, what, you know, how are you taught to get through things? Mm -hmm. How are you taught to work through emotions? How are you taught to thrive? How are you taught to you know, figuring out what is happening and releasing and working through all that. Most people are not taught that. I mean, I wish, you know, they taught emotional intelligence and wellness in school. And that's one of the reasons why in this new part of my life, I'm just so big on, I want to teach what schools don't teach us in terms of how can you be 
learning to not just toxic positivity, get over it. Everything is fine. Don't feel it. Mm -hmm. Pretend everything is okay. That's not helpful. Okay, piled up <laughs> life. And what you don't heal, you leave it to your children to heal. So I really think that I want to, you know, I'm on the path to help families and parents take care of their own unmet ne emotional needs and learn to cope with their emotions so they can teach their children that and break the intergenerational cycles of the trauma and things that we that we don't heal that we pass on so right. i when i did all that work i was like and that's one of the reasons why i waited so long to have a child because i was like i can't bring someone into this world knowing everything that i know and seeing all the people that i see till i'm in a place where I know what I'm doing to be able to read. And, and, and not that I know everything at this point. I know I'm going to make my own mistakes. I'm going to make my own mistakes as mom. But I'm in a place where I know that I know to get him help and teach him, do everything that I know best as I can, and then still being open to getting him the help if he needed that help someday. Because like I said, at some point in our human experience, we all go through suffering. Just because yeah. I'm a mother doesn't mean he will never suffer. But I will be there to hold him and help him through that process if he, he needs me to. So um, now that I did all my healing, because my grandmother I knew that was suffering from severe depression. My mother had depression at some point of her life. My sister and I both had it. So at some point, you know, and we are all in a place now through therapy and all the work that we did where, yes, you know, we've learned coping skills, learned how to heal, learned how to adapt and be better and be intelligent about our emotions and be aware of what they're trying to teach us. So it's not that suffering doesn't happen. It, does, it doesn't mean that if you're emotionally intelligent or agile, it's just that your resiliency and the way you bounce back is much faster and easier and looks different than the way you did in the past. So, yeah. Do you find it, um, do you find that men are, harder to get them to talk about it because um just in conversations like with my brother and i about uh you know talking about my dad he's like oh i'm good like i'm you know i figured out how to work through it myself and i'm just like i don't want to press right right but i'm like did you exactly <laughs> Yeah. And like sometimes that's where I want to be like, D but did you? did you? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I don't want, you know, my dad was a huge believer in generational blessings, generational yeah. Yeah. curses. Yeah. And he was adamant about breaking curses mm -hmm. in his bloodline. And I don't want like my brother to pick something up that my dad worked so hard to break. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. Why is why are men so hard to to get them to seek therapy my feelings. or so, yeah? Um, good question because I'm actually connected to a really amazing guy. His name is Rish Mitra, and his podcast is called Dads and Des Deadlifts. And so I don't like to generalize it to all men, but um, so I grew up with a dad um, who was not emotional, just straight up told me I don't express emotions and I don't do emotions, and I'm like. Okay, there, there's a reason why I do all the work that I do, because I had major daddy issues growing up. But, uh, you know, all men, like I said, all men and women, they experience emotions in their body. You experience it, whether it's just about, just like you experience, you know, heartbeat, you experience emotions. I mean, you feel it in your body. We all experience emotions, but the, the, the message that we grow up with, you have to be strong, it's okay, get over it, or, you know, um, for men, I'm I know mostly that they're raised with man up. Don't you know? There's no uh -huh. such emotion. There, you know, emotions are for women. You are weak if you have emotions or if you experience them. And, and I, at this point of my journey, I, and I do see men and women right in therapy, and but I find that men are less likely to seek help because of the the cultural and the societal conditioning that they grow up with. And that's why, like, I have a child who's a man, I mean, who's a boy. So I, I, and my husband, right, he is, he feels emotions. He notices it. He's very emotionally cognizant. I like that because, okay, and some men are just like, no, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm okay. Like, I'll, I don't think about it. Nothing is happening. And sometimes, like, 80% of the time, 
we are designed where we get through stuff, where we are resilient, we are able to, you know, work through stuff. 20% of the time, you're vulnerable and you are at risk of developing either depression, anxiety, or PTSD. And when I say developing, as in you, you, you are considered that you have these diagnoses when it impairs your psychological well-being, when it starts impairing the people around you, when it starts impairing your work or school. So it real so most of the time people are able to get through stuff, but then sometimes they don't, and then it catches up to them at some point of their lives. If you don't deal with it now, at some point it's catching up. It it, it just says I work with men who are 80 years old and who are very masculine and very manly, but at that point it caught up, you know, and yeah. then it came to me. So um what I would say is sometimes we can control other people's actions or responses to things, but we can control our reaction to how they go through things. We, as much as we like to save our loved ones, we, we can only save ourselves. We can only help those who want to be helped, but sometimes sure. people don't want to be helped. So I think the change will not come in, in, in our generation, but the change will come in the next generation based on what we've been through and normalize it to our children and the people around them, you know? Um, because now, these days, I'm noticing that a pe people our generation, like the men of our generation, sometimes there are two kinds of men. One that I don't know, everything is okay, great. In the meantime, there's just so much going on that you are just like, okay, well, you're going to work through it when you're going to work through it. And then there are some men who go seek help, go seek therapy, go do all these, you know, soul searching, spiritual programs, all these different things. And they're they're connected to both science and spirituality. So it really depends on what your journey is, what you were on, placed on this planet with, and what conditioning were you raised with. Some people get to a place where they're just like, this is not working. I need to change. I need to be more emotionally intelligent. I need to learn to be more connected with my emotions, to work through my emotions, to teach my kids that and break that intergenerational cycle. So. Sure. There are two different kinds of people in this world, and it really depends. Most of the time, unfortunately, I do see, like you said, I'm okay. I don't feel emotions. It's just for women. And I'm just like, you're headed for a train wreck real quick. But <laughs> and the thing is, it's really crazy because, like, my dad showed emotion. You know, he wasn't afraid to. Like, my uh, husband shows emotion. He's not afraid to. And yeah. I find that so sexy. I'm like, wow, you have like, emotions. I think it's just there normal like yeah you care but i i do um want to mention there was a a documentary that i watched and i cannot remember the name of it but <laughs> there was all these like uh therapists and nutritionists and all these people like holistic type um talking and they were talking about how when you keep so much trauma and feelings, emotions bottled up, that sometimes it can wreak havoc on your body to the point where yes. you're getting diabetes, cancer, yes. kidney yes. failure, oh, absolutely. you know, blood pressure, all the things. I think and that documentary was called Heal. Uh, it's on Netflix. I've, I, maybe it's called Heal because that's it's along. You the know same what? Way. Maybe maybe that's it. Because uh, <laughs> I'm like I'm trying to think of where I saw it, but. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking and, and watching this and thinking like, wow, like, like it, I mean, I got migraines and ulcers from yeah. stress and anxiety, yeah. Yeah. but to think that you keep hold of so much trauma and emotions and it comes in that package. Um, I know, you know, my husband even thought like, wow, cause he, when he was going through therapy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, because cancer really does a toll, not just on the, him, but the caregiver too. But um, when he was working through some things and things were brought up in his sessions and he was like, wow, maybe maybe there is some truth to that. Because when we first watched it, he was like, oh, that's that ain't right. But then as oh, he was working really through things, he was like, could I have gotten because of things that I held on to mm -hmm. and it kind of made us think like wow like you know obviously we can't go back and be like yeah oh life could have been this way yeah yeah it's 
is a done deal at this point. Okay. But it just made us realize, you know, be joyful in what we have, be grateful yeah. for the yeah. lives we do have, live each day to the fullest, yeah. you know, try to work through those emotions. If you feel a certain type of way, broadcast it. It's fine. Like we'll deal with it once it comes out. Yes. But we have to express them. We can't keep them bottled up because it does create sickness. It does. Um, there's this whole, I mean, I could go on for hours on that, but I'll make it quick and short. When you, like I was telling you, you know, it starts with your intuition. If you don't address that intuition, then it resets and really, you know, in, you feel it in your body. And eventually like two thirds of the emergency room visits and, you know, um, like PCP visits, which is primary care doctor visits, like your family doctor, are chronic stress related. So you um, end up getting depression, anxiety, uh, you know, like common fold and like common cold and all this red random things that happen uh, in my work because I do a lot of trauma, right? A lot of autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, uh, you know, lupus, um, my, multiple sclerosis, even cancers, they're very much, because you make your body very, when you live in this chronic stress, there's a there's a hormone in your body called cortisol. It's released and it, it's felt in your brain. Your emotions are trying to tell you something. It's like fight or flight. You know, before you can think about it, your body already goes in that mode. And if you're living in that mode for most of your life and not practices, practicing these habits that we just discussed earlier or disciplines, you're keeping your body in constant mode of fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. And it doesn't have any time or downtime to repair. And when you release all this cortisol, you affect your immunity. You affect your heart, heart, cardiovascular stuff. You affect your, you know, all this processes that are supposed to be running normally and smoothly are then now just dealing all the time with stress. And sometimes people are like, I'm not stressed. But well, you're not stressed, but your body is. Your body is. Your body absolutely is. So Mary, you're time, laughing, you know. Yeah. Over time, your migraines, your headaches, all those things are trying to tell you something. Yeah. They're trying to tell you, pay attention, there's something going on, work through this. So like I was telling you about the whole breath work thing earlier, um, and you can go on their IG channel. I'm one of my, that's where I'm getting my certification from. It's called Pause Breathwork, P-A-U-S-E. They have an amazing IG channel, which walks you through like 20, 30 minutes of all this guided, you know, breathwork stuff, which is amazing, amazing. I love it. Um, you can literally spend that time every day. That's what I was telling you, where you release all of those things and your brain, you can make your body equipped to fight all these things that it's supposed to be normally fighting. But if you've been through all this stuff in your childhood, then it accumulates through your 20s, then it accumulates through your 30s and 40s, and you don't work through them. Eventually, you know, like people who have built, dealt with chronic st stress or burnout over time, and you know, it's like their longevity is decreased. They don't make it past 70, 60, 70 years old because they've put their body through so much stress. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. When you exercise, when you even go for a walk, when you just are in nature, when you are walking bare feet on a grass, you decrease all this inflammation in your body that you don't take time for. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing, you know, and one thing I started doing as well is uh, when I wake up in the morning, I force myself to think of one positive thing, a positive thought in the morning, even if it's OK, Miriam, today you are going to dance for 10 minutes. Yes, yes. Shake what your mama gave you. Shake exactly. What your mama gave you. Right. Movement, movement has such a significant impact on your brain. There's a part of your brain called hippocampus. It regulates your emotions. It it it's involved in learning and it's involved in memory. It's like a time spam. You remember, you know, events and things that happen in your life, declarative events. That part of your brain shrinks when you are on constant stress. That part of the brain is also then gets bigger when you do these movement related that's why they say walk or just you know dance or just punch it all out or whatever it is that you do movement has a huge impact on healing 
I know, I know. And, you know some of the Love times that. when I'm vacuum, vacuuming, I'm dancing. So it takes half an hour before I'm done instead of 10 minutes. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Just spending 10 minutes with yourself, just appreciating your own company. I think sometimes we run away from ourselves and that's why it's like there's this whole retail therapy or drugs, sex, alcohol, gambling, you know, because we're just running away from our emotions for uh -huh. to food to temporarily feel better. And then we're right back where we started and then adding more yes. on top of that trauma with guilt. Like, damn, I shouldn't have done this. Like, oh, how that's stupid so am I? Same. You're adding more to that. Yeah. Uh, so, Shalgunyani, when did you support your community? When did you tell them about your trauma? Because it's not easy to tell your community, your family. I, uh, oh, um, in terms of my sexual abuse stuff, um, I told them when I was going through my therapy in my 20s. So it happened in my early, you know, um, and with PTSD, one of the things that happens too, it sometimes it doesn't, the onset is not right away. It can happen much, much, much later in uh -huh. life. So um, it's actually very tricky. So I told them when, as I was going through my healing process, because I was not able to talk about it. the whole time. In my head, I felt unlovable, worthless, powerless, and invisible. And I just, I couldn't tell anybody that. And I don't think anybody knew in my family because we didn't grow up with mental health. Like, let's talk about mental health. Now I talk about it and everybody, you know, around me talks about it. I think that's a cultural thing. It is a cultural that's... thing. Oh, absolutely. So we didn't <laughs> grow up with talking about mental health. But now it's like, yeah, if this is happening, we're going to talk about it. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable but we're gonna talk about it. So I, I told them that. And then as I was healing through that process, I, I there's a kind of therapy that I'm, that I'm trained in, it's called EMDR. You can look it up on my website. It's called um, gpatelcounseling.com. And EMDR, it's you just move your eyes left and right. And it was like a lot of subconscious work because sometimes just talking about it doesn't do the job or it's not as healing. And that's what I do with people that come to me. I mean, we've worked through things where people have been raped, but then they are absolutely at peace with that now. And, you know, they can talk about it. They don't feel anything about it. It's just like talking about going to a grocery store. You don't feel any emotion related to it, but you've reprogrammed your brain and rewired it to who you are now, making peace with it, forgiving yourself for going through it and forgiving others. It doesn't come um, by yourself or just on its own, I think it takes a lot of work and help to get to that place. How so. did your community, your tribe react when you told them? Were they shocked? Were they supportive? Were they like, nah, we don't believe you? Like what, how did that? It, 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 it depends. Um, so some people, obviously my parents were, my mom was very supportive and very in it with me. Like I was telling you with my dad, I just, he doesn't experience emotions, so I didn't know how to get through them, right? Um, so then I reached out to my grandpa and then I wrote a letter and then things worked out. It was someone I knew. And most of the time it is people that you know, 98% of the time it's people that you know. So, uh, you know, um, some people were resistive, resisting of that in, in our family, not everybody, but some people were and that's okay. But the person that I, uh, it was my cousin, so, he came and told me sorry. And that was very cathartic because I was just, I wrote a letter, it was a process. First, everybody was shocked. It was just like, they didn't want to believe it. It was a lot of times people go through it where, you know, it's, they put it back on the person who went through it. And it's like, you're making this up or this or that. Yeah. In my situation, it wasn't that, it, they knew it, but they were just like, we're not going to do anything about it. And other than one part, my uncle uh, talking to my cousin and, you know, um, sort of uh, working through that. So I got the piece that I needed. I just needed a sorry and I ha got that. Not everybody does. But even in when I said with the MDR, we, we work it out in our, my, I mean, I had to do a lot of inner child healing work and I had to forgive myself for being in that place. And, you know, uh, some people were okay with it. Some people are not, but I, again, I'm very big on, karma. I, karma is not what is done unto you, um, but it is, you know, how you react to things that are happening with you. Um, so okay. I, 
you know, some people are not going to do or give you what you need and that's okay, but you have to be able to work that out in your head and how, you know, you want to work that out, what feels right for you and how can you get peace with that? Um, because forgiveness to me is not what happened is right. It just means that we choose to let go of the emotional hold that it's on having on us. And I didn't want to live wow. the rest of my life Hold me it holding me back and giving it power. Instead, I want to reclaim my power and live the life that I'm very much designed and placed on this planet for. That's like one of Matthew's favorite. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Reclaiming <laughs> power. Mm -hmm. yes. That's Miriam right there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Claiming my power, owning my well being. I am worthy of a wonderful life too. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I yeah. love it. I, I mean, could talk you. to you for hours. I know. <laughs> Same we, here. I just appreciate <laughs> you being so open and, um, you know, people that are tuning in um, now and then on the replay, I'm sure your story is going to touch yeah. somebody, even if it's just one person. I, I think that that's amazing um, for you to be open because I know there's so many people that keep those type of stories to themselves, you know, and um, just I in my book, uh, I actually devote one whole chapter to therapy, yeah, and um, seeking it. And mm. most of the time in African American communities, it's you go to church and pray about that. Yep. You gonna yep. give that up to to the Lord? Yeah. Okay, yep. <laughs> but I can help too. <laughs> I need some. I need someone to talk to me right. here too. Like I believe in all of that. Yes. I, because that, right. that was one of the hurdles that I went through. Like I, I was so <laughs> ingrained in Hinduism, like God is supposed to take care of you. And I'm like, why is God doing this to me then? And then I'm like, I'm seeking answers. I genuinely wanted to change, genuinely wanted to heal, but I needed answers for what was happening to me. I mean, what was, it was happening to me. And I, I, I now embrace that not with self pity, but it's just with just observing and non judgmentalness where it's just like things were happening. Now, what are the answers? I, I, because obviously I, my cap is here. So I'm only able to think this much, like you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. that's why when I went to therapy, I learned all these things that I didn't know that I was like, wow, okay. Now I've learned all these things before. Mm -hmm. Then it was books, and back then it was wasn't podcasts and stuff. But I read a lot of books. I I was connected to a lot of you know like the whole law of attraction and all that stuff. Like I needed more answers. I needed more sure. at that time. Now I've grown a lot since then, but I, I just sought more things that I wasn't getting just from believing in God. There there had to be more. So yeah, yeah. I mean. And just being more open and talking about it, you know, I, I grew up in a household where we talked about feelings and yeah. my husband did not. So, <laughs> you know, just having that dichotomy too of, yeah. how are you feeling today? Huh? What? You want to, <laughs> let's, let's sit at the dinner table and talk about our day. Why? Yeah. Let's go watch, let's just go watch TV and watch TV. But I want to talk about our feelings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just the continual, you know, of uh, merging of different uh childhoods, you know. So yeah, yeah. um, but yeah, no, it and you know, for me, you know, trauma is so much more than than just um grief, you know. Yeah. Miriam and I go into some deep stuff in our uh, respective books about, you know, what we had to do as a caregiver. I mean, that was traumatizing. <laughs> I'm no. not going to lie. So, no. and yeah. two, you know, me, yeah. I wasn't married to him yet. So I hadn't even taken that vow. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my grandfather, who I'm now helping um, take care of, he, in the beginning of our relationship, you know, he was like, wow, you, you guys are amazing. And he told, he told my husband, he said, you should be thankful for her, not just because she's my granddaughter, but most women probably would have left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most women probably would have left by now. Um, 
But my husband knows that. And he tell he still tells me thank you to this day, which I know Martin does yeah. for Miriam. Yeah. yeah. You know, she, you know, it, it was traumatizing for her to see her brother in the way that she had to see him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, is. so caregiving is traumatizing. Um, grief, of course, is any type of loss, yeah. you know, whatever that looks like for you. So I'm just glad that we were able to have this discussion um, today with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I, oh, we could keep talking forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed yeah. it. And thank you for having it, me, ladies. It was absolutely an honor. Yeah. Oh, this was great. Yeah. You know, I, I'm at a loss for words because you just, you just <laughs> brought so much stuff up. And it's like, wait, I have another question, but I want to be respectful of <laughs> everyone. <laughs> So we'll have to do this again. Come back. Can, I can always come back. Podcast again. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so guys. much. I really enjoyed it. And um, if I don't know if our viewers, listeners, if you have questions, please drop them so yes. we can send them over to uh, Punyani. Yeah. And it was such an honor to have you here. I learned a lot again. It was so relatable, all yeah. your tips. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. No, for, thank, thank you guys you. for having me. It was absolutely an honor. Uh, Definitely. I love being connected to like-minded thought leaders who are doing their part to heal and making a difference and paying it forward to others. Because I think when we heal, um, we can give it back. If we are not in a place where we are in a good place, then I think it's time to start there taking care of yourself and taking care of you because you absolutely matter. Absolutely. And I posted uh, the website where you can get more information. Yeah. Of course, I've got the banner rolling there where you can find all three of us on Instagram, um, please follow um, and like. I mean, just reach out to any one of us, whether you're a caregiver or not a caregiver. We are open and willing to help. We are just here to shed all the light and love Absolutely. and hope that we can. Because there is a light at the end of that tunnel. Yeah. And like Miriam always says, if you're willing to, you know, go through that tunnel, yes. we can get you to that light. Absolutely. Like you were saying earlier, healing is absolutely possible, but it's not easy. And I tell people that, yes, it's going to be difficult, but going through it with someone is easy or easier. Yeah. Because if I would have, I would have never gotten to a place where I am if it wasn't for someone else. Like sometimes it's like, like I was saying, you cap it because you're not ready to see it all and you can't see it all because you're in it. And when you are, you know, supported, loved and held, then you want to see it. You see, you see your worth in being able to get through it. So it's not easy, but if you go through it with someone that is absolutely willing to hold you through that process, it's yes. good. Absolutely. Right. I love Def it. Yeah, definitely um, check us out. Like I said, uh, I have put in um, these lovely ladies' websites for you to go to. Um, check out uh, Miriam's Caregiver 2.0. You know, you are a caregiver 1.0 right now. You need to get with Miriam to become 2.0. <laughs> and then when you get it done, when you get done and you become that caregiver 2.0, come see me at Timeless Dream Events and we go on a party or like Mary said, shake what your mama gave you. <laughs> <laughs> well, peace and love, everyone. Thank you for tuning yeah. in and watching the replay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys.